Welcome to Think In, a podcast series by Kautilya School of Public Policy. Hello, welcome to Kautilya School of Public Policy. This is Audumbar Savan. You are watching our policy podcast, Think In. It is often said that policies are all about politics. So it is incumbent upon all of us to understand the political process. As India is celebrating its 75 years of its independence, uh, we will explore the journey of Indian democracy in the last 75 years, particularly the democratic politics, the way it has got evolved, and its contemporary position. And to discuss this with me, I am delighted to have with us Dr. Swas Palshikar, an eminent political scientist, one of India's leading political commentator. Uh, he is also the columnist to the Indian Express. He taught political science at the University of Pune. He has been visiting fellow to the University of Chicago. He is currently chief editor to the uh, journal called as the Studies of Indian Politics. He is also co-director to Lokniti, Comparative Study in Indian Politics. It's a great privilege and honor to have you, sir, today on the show. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, sir, uh, we are in the 75 years of its our independence, and we adopted this democratic form of government in 1950. Since then, uh, our democracy has seen many ups and downs. We witnessed the era of uh, darkness called as a uh, emergency. And today's politics that we see, so through your lens, how do we assess India's democracy? Abhimbar, uh, some of you might have seen the book. Uh, it's a small tract uh, uh, that I wrote a few years ago. And at the risk of... Uh, what could be construed as self-promotion, I would mention that because that book exactly does what you are asking me. It's a short introduction to Indian democracy. Uh, it's part of the OUP series called Oxford India Short Introduction Series. Uh, this book, uh, in a sense, summarizes what I have to say today uh, also about India's democracy. Two or three things quickly to begin with so that then you can roll out your questions. In the first place, democracy is never, not just in India, but anywhere, democracy is never a project that completes itself. It's a continuously evolving project. That's one. Secondly, it's a project which doesn't go unilinearly, that you start the progress and you can continue the progress. That doesn't happen. Democracies need nurturing. They need protection. And therefore, it is always possible that there are ups and downs in the journey of democracy. And thirdly, there is always a possibility that the people, the citizens who run democracy and for whom democracy is run, they slip. And as a result of that, democracy goes off the track. It goes somewhere else. And in other words, there is a deviation. So that's the larger framework within which one has to look at India's democracy also. Therefore, we will not be surprised if we find ups and downs in democracy of India's uh, 75 years of experience. You mentioned the emergency, and rightly so, because that was one point at which there was a low, there was a down in the journey of India's democracy. We have seen people voting against the emergency, and therefore there was a high as well. So it is these people, an abstract idea called the people who are citizens and whose stakes are involved in democracy, who have to nurture and evolve democracy. In the 1990s, some of us were saying that India's democracy is being enriched further, which then means that the meaning and the idea of democracy also expanded at a certain stage in India's 75 years of history. So that would be my introductory comment to your question about India's democracy. Yes. Uh, so, sir, we have seen that uh, democracy as a form of government has expanded in the 20th century, and today we are in the 21st century. So, recently, Singapore's Prime Minister, he made a pertinent comment about India, that our founding fathers, they had a great vision, they had a great courage to establish India as a liberal constitutional democracy. So, do you think that, do we really, live, are we really living up to that expectation or has it something turned out to be different? See, if our founding fathers were around today, I think they would both feel happy that democracy has 
taken roots in this society that democracy has expanded in this society and moreover the aspiration for democracy has become firmer among many sections the same founding fathers at the same time perhaps would have lamented so many aspects of india's democracy one that you mention in the case of the singapore uh, prime minister mentioning criminalization and the entry of criminals or suspects in politics but that's not the only thing probably our founding fathers would have also lamented that the constitutional basis of india's democracy is constantly being eroded over a period of time and we are probably facing a period of crisis now uh, two uh, us based scholars only recently wrote a book which is titled as how democracies die and in that book they point out that democracies die often not from external threats to democracy but through democratic means themselves in a sense therefore the danger for democracy is within democracy itself that people will use democratic measures to undermine democracy and that is probably the danger about which our founding fathers must be thinking very seriously today so it would be a mixed reaction yes so you are referring to the potential dangers and what sort of problem we can yes. have yes in our batch also we often have discussions about our democracy and some people are very pessimistic so they said that democracy is a failure so do are we really becoming plutocratic democracy as some may point out or what sort of democracy actually we are to put it simply some scholars have said that india has become an electoral only democracy or election only democracy that is to say when elections come there is a fair amount of democratic competition and free competition when elections disappear or when elections conclude there is some kind of an oligarchy or plutocratic rule and our rulers are never responsible to the voters that's one set of arguments the other set of arguments coming up more recently is that india is becoming an electoral autocracy which is to say that while formally there may be elections our social political cultural and economic milieu is increasingly becoming so non democratic that elections are also becoming less meaningful than they were earlier so there is there is a continuum of negative assessment of democracy whereas those who are optimists would say that india's democracy will thrive we fought the emergency and came bouncing back even if therefore today there is some setback people will fight back that setback that's an optimistic argument the official argument of the ruling party and the government which has made headlines only recently is that india's democracy is probably even more thriving than it was previously and the ministry of external affairs has in fact issued a small note so that we can understand how india's democracy is thriving now this sponsorship of optimistic view of democracy needs to be kept aside and we need to look at democracy from an independent and citizen centered view point which points to the limitations of democracy more than to the achievements of democracy yes so you mention about different sort of uh, analysis so particularly india has become a electoral democracy and so it is a kind of miscellaneous reaction about the nature of indian democracy today. so since you mention about election so the period of 1990 was very defining period yes. and whatever kind of uh, politics we see today has its origin in 1990s so in this next segment uh, we will talk about uh, different issues in one of your interviews you mention about tms market mandal and mandir mm -hmm. so i'll come to that later uh, the first important uh, era is the era of coalition i think that was the period when you also started as your career as a political scientist so 2014 general elections they completely disrupted this trend of coalition era 
so how do you see the future of coalition era because at national level it seems to be that there is uh, again the dominant party single largest parties ruling the country but at the regional level we see some unholy alliances based on pragmatism to put it uh, simply so how do you look at at this entire pro issue of coalition government see you are right 90s is the key to many of the things that are unfolding today but let us go back a little not just the 90s look at the late 60s maybe and you will find that coalitions were also sought after during that decade in the 70s again you will find that coalitions were the order of the day the 90s become distinguished because in the 90s coalitions became the kind of way in which parties can run governments even in delhi at the all india level so what existed at the state level gets transposed to the all india level in the 1990s politics is always a matter of coalitions and alliances whether they are between and among parties or within parties a party when it becomes dominant also has to acquire a characteristic of a coalition otherwise it fails the moment the congress party stopped developing that characteristic the downfall of the congress began and that was in the 1970s and the 80s today as you point out we are again back to the era of what one can describe as single dominant party system or dominant party system this dominant party will have to acquire the nature of a coalition internally if it doesn't do that then this party will also face the same future that the congress had to face in the 1990s in that sense i would say that in democratic politics coalition is the core sometimes those coalitions happen outside the party what we call as coalition making and then okay. therefore we talk of pragmatism and you used and i could see the word quote under quotations unholy what yes. is unholy i don't know because a coalition is always a pragmatic arrangement and politics is about pragmatism so to stop you there what i yes, mean yes. Is, uh, so recently we 2019 election we saw in maharashtra yes unholy in the sense two ideologically opposite parties are coming together so this is something different means this is something unacceptable uh, ideally speaking so how do you look at it i would i mean i don't want to go into a debate over this but i would ask what was the janata party of 1970s which defeated the congress party's emergency in 1977 elections there the socialists and the charan singh party which was farmers party or rural party and the janasang which was opposed to the socialists they came together to form the janata party within congress earlier you would similarly find the so called leftists and the rightists coexisting in the congress party therefore i am somewhat intrigued when people only single out certain parties like you are in your case maharashtra's example or for that matter janata dal united of nitish kumar having an alliance with the bharatiya janata party now opponents of the bjp also criticize the same way saying that this is unholy my point is that politics is the art of the possible and you have to therefore negotiate with everyone and draw a line within which you will make alliances without necessarily giving up your ideology sometimes you change in the course of that coalition making sometimes your partners change in the process of that coalition this is how politics unfolds yes so you are I saying Yeah. since in india we are enamored of examples from the west or outside of india when israeli parties form a coalition we are not intrigued yes or when the republican or democratic party of us within themselves have such desperate disparate sorry disparate views 
coexisting we don't say they are a bad coalition we give that as an example of how there can be a negotiated settlement either within or outside the party i think the same we are speak applies to india so through these through these global examples as you are saying that it is a part of politics and so we can also understand that recently the israeli government naftali bennett became a prime minister it's a coalition of different ideologies absolutely so so i'll come to the next question which is inseparable indian politics that is identity politics and you often talk about that referring to mandir and mandal uh to an ideal ideal world identity is something people is it is a kind of anathema to them that why should we talk about caste why should we talk about religion but it is part and parcel of our system our society so how do you see uh, the identity policy politics in the last 30 years particularly the obc politics and the dalit politics we have had leaders like kashiram in northern india in maharashtra we had our own dalit political movement in southern india there was this yes. pmk movement so in overall how do we see this identity politics the current nature of identity politics in india yeah you know of course india or the indian society is made up of so many identities and we should be proud of that when somebody asks you who are you and you are in maharashtra you will tell them that you are from such and such part of maharashtra let's say western maharashtra marathwada or wherever when you move to kautilya school of uh, public policy for example and they ask you who are you then you proudly would say i am a marathi person when you move out of india and ask people ask you who are you you would say i am an indian in other words identities are ever evolving and concentric circles of how we identify ourselves in different contexts and that context make us makes us our identity that's one secondly identity in itself is not bad and not only specific to india either there are identities in every society but in india there the overlap among identities is much more deep than in many other countries having said all this let me come back to your question you are asking about identity politics and there are different versions or varieties of identity politics let's take three examples or four examples to begin with and that would include your question the identity of dalits unless dalits evolve an identity and fight for their identity they can't even fight for their rights and their existence that is the lesson which we have learned from dr ambedkar therefore dalit politics makes an important step in the direction of integration of a particular community in the larger political process kanshiram with all the limitations of his politics and i am not upholding all his politics would i would still say that kanshiram facilitated this process in north india in particular of integration of the scheduled castes in the larger political process and their ability to demand their stakes in politics the same is true of obc politics obc is a somewhat complicated term evolved through our policy and administration it is other backward classes but these other backward classes often consist of the backward communities or castes of india in north india again their politics was weak in the 1960s they started fighting back whereas as you rightly pointed out in south the dravida movement and in maharashtra the satyashodak and the brahmanetar movements much earlier started making the same claims all these are instances of obc politics and the net contribution of obc politics is that now every party has to take note of backward classes when they are doing politics the share of obc mlas and mps is increasing in our legislatures a day will come when they will also start staking claims in executive powers as well so i would argue that both dalit and obc politics have made an important contribution 
I will come to their limitation in a minute. The two other examples one can imagine, however, and then the limitations begin, is identity based on religion. And immediately you will find that the partition of India had its roots in this particular identity formation among the Muslims on the one hand and also among the Hindus, but not as strong then as it is today. Therefore, identity formation can also be notoriously problematic, just as it can be very helpful for democratization. It's a two-edged or double-edged sword. If you use it, you need to know how much and how to use it. Otherwise, you tend to get wounded and bloodshed, whether in 1947 or bloodshed in the 90s that happened through the Ram Janmabhumi agitation are bad instances of identity politics. And finally, the final example that I would like to give is identity based on gender. Is this good or bad? You can ask this question to yourself and I'm sure you will answer that, that yes, all politics always needs a gender dimension and therefore if women sort of appropriate their identity and start fighting back, there is in fact expansion of democracy, not a danger to democracy. So it is both a blessing, but an overemphasis on identity can always trump all other issues and therefore problematic. Yes, so for marginalized communities, it can be a tool for assertion. And if we use it as a religion, it could be a division in the society. So yes, but I must add that even for marginalized communities, an overdose of identity would mean that they lose track of all other factors. And finally, identity is used only as a label rather than as a substantive argument or substantive policy. That's the problem with identity. Yes, sir. So in your last point, you mentioned about gender and women. So how do you see the vision of feminine, uh, uh, the feminine politics, the women entering into politics? At local level, we have this vision of 50%, but at, in reality, we know what happens. And at the national level, they are underrepresented. So through your experience of uh, watching Indian politics for many decades, how do you see the role of women and their position to in the first place, you mentioned 50% reservations in local bodies, etc. And therefore, in terms of representation and share in power, we are far, far away from according fair share to women in political or public power. The reason obviously being that in private power sectors, that is to say industry or family, women are even more oppressed and marginalized than they are in politics. So in a sense, politics is only a reflection of this reality of marginalization of women from positions of not only power, but positions of self-respect. And therefore, one has to keep pushing and adopting policies which would at least from top-down manner ensure that women get some representation. The Women Reservation Bill was about this. But you will find that leave aside the Women Reservation Bill, even voluntarily, no party gives enough candidature to women candidates within their own party. Not in party positions, leave aside in elections. And therefore, women are far away from that. So uh, it is a long journey for them. Yes, and, and, and there our record compared to many other countries is extremely pessimist and negative, we have failed to give share of power to half the population. So you can imagine what kind of a limited democracy we are. Yes. So before going to the last segment of the interview, I'll quickly run to the two questions, which are very important. Uh, in the recent years, what we see, sir, uh, the political opportunism where uh, party candidates, top political leaders, they are leaving their party and they're going into the other camp to be in the power. On the other hand, we have seen uh, many staunch loyal supporters. They are working at the grassroots level for many decades, but they don't uh, leave the party. So this uh, proclivity of top leaders leaving their party and going 
is it isn't it set, setting a wrong precedent in indian politics because it is compromising uh, I, ideology so what is your take on that i think you have rightly framed the question if someone personally were to leave a party because of ideological differences and having a change of heart ideologically speaking i think that is perfect but what we find out in actual reality is not this kind of change of heart but parties are changed as you change your clothes on a daily basis and there are examples literally even today of people having changed party overnight and again changed party overnight some of you might have heard this term ayaram gayaram which yes. was made famous in the late 1960s because an mla changed a party twice during the day in the morning and in the evening and that's why the term ayaram gayaram ki aapko pata bhi nahi chalta hai ye kahan aaya aur kab gaya kahan gaya but in the present election that is going on in goa this is exactly being repeated where a candidate from party a went to party b then came back to party a and then went back to party b yet again and all this happened in 48 hours now this kind of party hopping is deeply problematic we have not been able to sort this problem out legally and politically the legal route is simple the legal route is if you change the party you should be stopped from contesting and holding any political office for 3 or 5 years in instead of that we have a stupid non useful anti defection act which oh. is ineffective all these years politically the point is not about legal measures but simply my party should not give tickets to someone who has only come yesterday just because he or she wants a certain political position in my party people should not elect such candidates but that doesn't happen so i think there is this political as well as legal failure why does this happen partly this happens because of what you described as opportunism but partly there is a structural reason to this as well which is that our parties and party system are not stabilized parties are so weak organizationally that there is no mechanism of negotiation and discipline in the party you need to keep both in that balance both there has to be a democratic negotiation there has also to be discipline parties are unable to do that party system is in flux as we pointed out at the beginning from coalition to multi party to dominant party we are moving from one to the other as a result of which this party hopping takes place so it's not just the individual failure i think it is also the larger structural issues of the party system which are involved in this what is known as defection or party hopping and that's a deeply problematic issue in our democratic politics so in a sense you are referring to electoral reforms particularly within the party system so kind of a regulation that we need to have yes it's not just electoral reforms parties also need to be reformed Reform. yeah. and that reform has to be done at the party level not just legally legal yeah so i'll come to the next question since you are mentioning about the party system uh, apparently it seems that india is a multi party system Mm -hmm. on the paper because there are around eight national uh, parties in india but apart from bjp and congress we don't see the pan india presence of other political parties like adm k dmp they are limited in their own state they play the good regional politics at the local level but they fail to acquire this pan india presence so how do you think in a sense we are only two party system on paper we are just multi party system see we must understand a the scale at which our democratic politics operates and b the diversity in the country once you look at both these factors you will realize that having parties operating only at the state level primarily what are now described as state based parties or state wide parties is a very natural outcome of what we have in india as the larger indian society the idea that parties need always to be all india parties is i guess 
a borrowed idea from the west where you find that the societies are small and much more homogeneous than indian society and therefore you can imagine parties like the socialist party of france or the labor in england and so on and so forth you can imagine only all what you can call all india that is national level parties i don't think that india would necessarily have only national parties i think it is very natural that india would have many parties operating only at the state level you mentioned only two parties having been in power but even today at this moment as we talk just start listing out the parties that are in power in their respective states andhra pradesh telangana odisha west bengal tamil nadu down south and jharkhand and perhaps in punjab at one point of time and so on and so forth in other words we have multi party system in a thriving sense of the term though some of these parties can't cross the threshold of the state and go to the national level sometimes they do go sometimes they can't go i think that's part of the game i wouldn't worry about that so do you see do you see in the future emergence of any other this uh, regional level parties as a pan india party trinamool trying to do that trinamool congress i wouldn't know it is very risky to guess but yes you are right the trinamool congress party is certainly trying to become that but at this moment as we speak they are yet to cross the threshold of west bengal even if they could cross west bengal and go into tripura i would say that the beginning has been made but that would not happen very easily it is very difficult to cross these thresholds and that is the difficulty of the party system as well as the political electoral system that we have adopted in india then what's the why media for them the why media for them is to tie up with some other parties and tie up with some all india party or parties and thus play an important role in delhi's all india politics that is what the state parties did during 1990s and much of the earlier part of the 2000s the first decade of this century the moment one single dominant party emerges like the bjp today state parties are pushed back into their states again yes so it is a kind of uh, seesaw battle that is going on between on the one hand a genuinely multi party system and on the other hand a dominant party system that is now emerging over the last 6 7 years yes so it is not easy for any political party it's going to be a not easy task. yes uh, very complex task it would be so i'll come to the last segment as we are running out of time sure so the question of majoritarianism mm-hmm. many political scientists and scholar they are extremely concerned about the rise of majoritarianism in india so this fundamental notion of uh, preponderance of single identity over other over other identities how do we look at it and before uh, we dwell into that question so can you just uh, for our audience tell us the difference between political majority and majoritarianism i'll quote some lines of your article that you wrote in indian express recently electoral democracies are seen unabashedly as flowing from and reflecting the majority of one community so just explain this to us what you mean to say i think uh, you have you have really framed this well because you already said that a single identity becoming the defining feature of the entire society is a problematic way of formulating politics in any politics and particularly in electoral politics the elected majority being dominant is always a problem and 100 years or more than 100 years ago also philosophers have pointed out this as tyranny of the majority in the sense of tyranny of the elected majority only that's true what we are worrying about and bothered about in the indian context however is a certain majority claiming that we are a majority in this society in terms of xyz factor not just elected factor and therefore this country belongs only to us others can live here at our let's say mercy at our disposal 
that majoritarianism in other words can happen in the indian context either on the basis of one language and one language community saying that we are majority or it can happen on the basis of probably religion that one religion claiming that because we are a majority religion india belongs to us this politics of single religion being a majority and therefore claiming ownership of india is almost 100 years old politics but in the last 3 decades it has become very predominant in the name of what is called currently as hindu nationalism while it is called hindu nationalism it is not related only to hindu religion as such in the sense that it has nothing to do with hindu religious city it is nationalism which identifies itself with a certain idea of who we are as hindutva it is this hindutva nationalism which is a problem for the country not just theoretically but in practical terms because it is now a popular way of doing politics since the 1990s and since last 7 8 years this ideology is the ruling ideology of the party in power in the country therefore it is problematic yes sir uh, we have got one question from our student friend so he is saying that political scientists are always good at explaining the stuffs different things but what is the way forward so my question is to you when we talk about majoritarianism we have seen what happened in sri lanka so how worried are you about these recent trends because the events that had happened in the last couple of months and you wrote said even another article hijab is not a reform for secularism you are indicating uh, in a very subtle way so what is the way forward how can we tackle is it too only people's movement or judiciary <coughs> institute like judiciary can play a role to yeah. avert this crisis sure thank you uh, the first part of this question rightly points out the limitation of political science at the level of explanation at which political science currently is and world over and in india also political science is trying to at least have middle range theorizations and not just explanations post facto so the question is correct not only in its political aspect but even its methodological aspect i should say that there is a limitation to political science given that limitation what do i see as the short range possibilities and again the question is excellent not because it is worded so well but it hints at the possible answer what is the short range possibility that i can see i see that if this kind of majoritarianism continues in india then the dangers that sri lanka faced on the question of simhala versus tamil the dangers that pakistan once faced and got divided practically on the question of urdu versus bangla the danger that canada faces between the french canadians and the english canadians or the danger that spain faces on the question of catalina all these are possibilities that stare india in the face instability and possible rise eruption of fissiparous tendencies tendencies that want to go away from this center which is centered around hindutva identity but then i would also add that this means that minorities non hindu minorities in particular have been issued a warning that they are substandard citizens of this country and they need to live with this consciousness that they are secondary citizens not fully equal citizens of the country so my prognostication is that because of this majoritarianism that we are currently witnessing the non hindu communities in this country are going to get more marginalized than ever than before to that extent even the hindus in this country will not enjoy democracy fully because that democracy will always be having a repressive element attached to it the last part of that question is how do we handle this electorally you can handle this 
obviously by defeating a party which is pro hindutva but that is not enough because obviously because it is a dominant party other parties will not fight the dominant party on this ground they will fight on some other grounds thus the hindu majoritarianism though electorally defeated will remain and therefore the two arenas of real fight are people's movements on the one hand and culture on the other hand the most important arena in the next two decades is going to be cultural arena where contestations will take place what is our real culture what do i mean when i say that i am a hindu so the problem is not really going to be hindu versus non hindus the problem is going to be hindus versus hindutva that is the problem that we are going to face if hindus really want to be religious they would like to have their religious freedom rather than hindutva if they get packaged in hindutva they lose their hindu religion it is as simple as that so that's the scenario i can see in the short range yes so you have put it very precisely the difference between hindu and hindutva so let's be optimistic that something will happen positive uh, and we cannot face situation like sri lanka uh, thank you very much sir we are completely run out of time sure uh, uh, thank you very much uh, and i hope that this uh, conversation will provide a sort of analytical framework to the audience who are watching particularly the discerning audience who take keen interest in politics thank you for today we'll come back in the next thank you and thank you to the audience and your colleagues at the school